Hi, hello, and welcome to the ninth episode of the Stage Manager Supply Co. podcast. We have no sponsor this episode, but instead are brought to you by Rehearsal Room Coffee. Rehearsal Room Coffee. There's no pleasing everyone. My name is Claire. I am your host, and thank you for joining me today. As we start every podcast, I would first like to say that Black Lives Matter, and that I am creating this content on the traditional lands of the Kickapoo, Peoria, Potawatomi, Miami, and Sioux tribes. We will always start the podcast acknowledging the inequitable history and landscape of the United States, including but never limited to the fact that we are a country built on stolen land and developed on the backs of slaves. Stage Manager Supply Co. is my own attempt to bridge generations of systematic racism and oppression by making stage management arts education much more accessible. Today, I would like to highlight Covenant House. Covenant House was founded in 1972 to serve homeless youth with absolute respect and unconditional love. Today, with sites in more than 30 cities, they are the largest privately funded agency in the Americas providing food, shelter, crisis care, and essential services to homeless young people. But they go beyond offering an immediate safe harbor. They encourage each young person to move forward along a path to independent adulthood, free from the risks of homelessness. Our guest today is a yearly participant in their stage and screen sleepout to fundraise for Covenant House. If you would like to learn more about Covenant House and donate what you are able, you can find the link to their website in the episode description. Two disclaimers before I introduce today's guest. Disclaimer number one. The views and opinions expressed in this podcast are those of the host and the guest, and do not reflect the official policy or position of any other agency, production, organization, employer, or company. Disclaimer number two. The host does not presume to be any sort of singular voice for stage management or stage managers. The views and opinions expressed by the host are extremely limited to the scope of her own experiences and are being widened each and every day. So, now that we've grounded our work in the reality of the world around us, let me introduce you to our guest. Our guest today is Ellen Goldberg. Ellen is a New York City-based stage manager with a wide variety of theatrical credits. She has worked on Broadway as a sub-ASM and PA on the most recent She Loves Me revival, Dames at Sea, and the 2015 Gigi revival. Ellen also has been an assistant stage manager at many off-Broadway companies, including Manhattan Theatre Club, The Atlantic, Classic Stage Company, Roundabout, The Public, and Signature Theatre, amongst others. Regionally, Ellen has worked at the Kennedy Center, Williamstown, Hartford Stage, and Center Theatre Group. She has also worked on multiple readings and workshops and received her BA from Fordham. Personally, I have assisted Ellen at Williamstown on the Closet and Dangerous House and consider her my big sister in both stage management and life. Ellen also introduced me to the glory of Bacon Sundays. Ellen, thank you so much for joining me today. You're very welcome. I'm excited to be here and I miss Bacon Sundays. Oh yes, Bacon Sundays are the best. Um, How are you holding up during quarantine? Good. I am well and safe. I um, moved back with my parents. Um, I was currently on tour when the pandemic hit in Fayetteville, Arkansas. And And I'd given up my apartment while being on tour. So back with parents it was, but I'm very fortunate that I have a lovely backyard, which is behind me. We can go on safe walks and we do a lot of golfing, which is a great social distance sport if anyone wants to learn it. <laughs> here, 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 here. <laughs> and we're doing pretty good. That's good. That's really good to hear that you're making the most of this time. Um, I want to start and just ask you what your journey was to stage management. How did you get interested in theater to begin with? And what was your education kind of like in theater? So I was introduced to theater at a very young age. I grew up just 30 miles from this city and my mom and grandma would take me to see Broadway shows 
all the time. I saw Les Mis when I was probably too young to see Les Mis. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I saw Rent as many times as I could save up to get a bus ticket and do the lottery. For those who know the Rent lottery is very exciting and very difficult. <laughs> uh, <laughs> And I just loved it. I couldn't wait to see our yearly show or maybe two shows a year. And, but I had no idea what stage management was. I went to a public high school. It was, you know, you paint the same flax every year, wear the costumes from 40 years ago. And, but it was just fun, you know? And then I went to a leadership camp just for, you know, college applications. And it just happened to be theater because I thought that would be fun. <laughs> and there was a PowerPoint about all the jobs in theater besides acting. And there was a slide or two about stage management. You know, Ooh. very basic, <laughs> you know, explained how stage managers are involved from the very beginning to the very end of a show's life. They interact with everyone, directors, the actors, designers, everybody, they're organized, they call a show, no idea what that meant. I was like, wait, <laughs> I'm gonna apply to college for this thing, I have no idea what it, what it is. <laughs> so, then I did. So I applied to all my colleges focusing on stage management or that I could minor in stage management, design, production, and I ended up at Fordham University in New York City, and it was a BA, as you mentioned, and I loved it, and I'm so happy and lucky that I actually love stage management once I actually learned what it actually is. <laughs> <laughs> and what, what did you enjoy about your time at Fordham, and what was it like going to school like in New York City, like at Lincoln Center? So when I toured the school as a high school student, to me, the campus was electrifying. It's on 60th and 9th Avenue for anyone who doesn't know where Fordham is. And it is just a short block from the Met Opera and just 20 blocks north of the center of theater in my mind, Broadway. And it was amazing to me. I remember there was a snow day where the city shut down and hair was still on Broadway and they said if you can afford, if you can get here because all the subways were shut down, well $20 tickets. And me and my friend, wow. yeah, me and my friend put on like snow pants and snow boots and we like trudged through the snow and we saw <laughs> hair for like $20 and I think we only filled up all the audience, like half the orchestra, but it was the most exciting performance because everyone was just there to yeah. enjoy theater. And you can't do that anywhere else. Where on you can a snow day can you see a Broadway show in That's your snow? Cool. <laughs> <laughs> so being there was so exciting. You have so many opportunities, not just Broadway, but you can see off Broadway, off off Broadway that unique brand new thing down down downtown and you can you can do all that you can rush shows you can do the lotteries you find out things from the very beginning of their inception which is awesome as a theater student and you get to meet all these really awesome people i also loved fordham because it was a ba so i got to take classes beyond theater I loved my anthropology classes and I even learned about philosophy and math and literature. So I felt that I was becoming a more well-rounded human and could be a more well-rounded well theater artist and create the education I wanted to in being in a small class, in a small theater program in one of the biggest cities in the world. Yeah. So what, during your time at Fordham and then kind of transitioning into your early career in New York, who were your, your early mentors? Who were the people that you connected with first that kind of gave you your first jobs? So my longest running mentors, I shall say, I met when I was an intern at Williamstown. Yes. Um, and they've stuck by me through thick and through thin. Um, and they were the first professional stage managers I ever worked with. 
Um, it was Libby Unsworth, Johnny Milani, and Jillian Oliver, who I'm still great friends with to this day, and we work together all the time. And I think part of also, I think a really awesome mentor-mentee relationship is that you become friends. Yeah. And what's so awesome about that is the trust that I trust them to be confidential with the um, information I'm sharing. If I'm um, struggling on a show or if I'm deciding between a job, taking it or not, all that stuff, it's, I trust that they have my best interests at heart and that they are keeping it in the safe cone of silence. Um, yeah. And also that they know, they know me so well by this point, is that they know if they need to give me the tough love or if they need to let me talk something out to vent or if I need a, if I need, need like a gentle nudge in the right direction. They know sure. me so well. And a lot of times you do need tough love. And yeah. they, they, and they tell me what I need to hear versus what I want to hear. And I trust them to do that. And, um, I don't know where I would be without them. Yeah. That's, that's such a good point of people who aren't afraid to tell you something you need to hear and not just have, yes, you can do that. Yeah. Go for it. Yeah. Apply there. Do what you want. Uh, but people who think about you as the human being and yeah. if a choice is right for you. Um, so were these people then instrumental in maybe your first jobs in New York? Definitely. Uh, Johnny got me my first paid job. We did a reading together. He called me the day before and said, can you do this reading with me at eight or nine in the morning and I was like yes yes I can <laughs> <laughs> and um Jillian is the reason I got my equity card off Broadway and they have been instrumental to a lot of the big jumps in my life whether they got me that jump or they connected me with the right people to get my jump or just gave me the right advice to guide me where I wanted to go sure um so can you talk to me a little bit about you uh, worked as a PA in New York before kind of moving into ASMing, which is kind of the level in life that I met you at. But um, what was it like being a PA? And you've also you've done a lot of subbing of stepping into, you know, a show and a role in the track that you maybe yourself didn't originate. So what kind of is the process of going from PA to being a sub and then being a full time ASM? So for me, I'm fortunate that majority of the time that I was a sub, I was the PA, which is mm -hmm so helpful because you know all the unique language of the show. When I subbed on my first Broadway show, Gigi, during, I remember there's a cue off of a part in the song we called Spanish. There's no <laughs> lyric Spanish. There's nothing that would make you think it's kind of Spanish music, but it's fast and it's all instrumental. And I remember standing there as I was learning the track. I was like, I'm so grateful. I know what Spanish means. <laughs> I'm thinking about it. I was so grateful. And especially uh, for me, when I learned Gigi, I had left the show at opening as a PA and it was a two deck track. And then while I was gone, until I came back to sub, it became a single deck track. So I had to pick things up really fast, but I, as I said, I knew all that language that was established from rehearsals and, pre and tech and previews that I could jump in to know exactly. And I knew the key players in each of the scenes. I knew the cast, I knew the crew. And then I knew the crew well enough to know if it was a sub and knew that I have to look out for that guy because it's his first day here. Sure. Um, so that is so unbelievably helpful. And then going on the other side, when you don't know the show at all and you're subbing, 
it is quite terrifying sometimes. <laughs> it was my, I was uh, subbing on a play off Broadway and it was my first time solo. The ASM was in the booth learning to call and I was on deck and we had to stop the show because an audience member was having a medical emergency. Oh, wow. And it was a very straightforward play. You just had a check preset. There were, you know, some minor cues, but I didn't know the show well enough to know where we stopped the show, where, based on where we picked up, where any of the props on stage need to be reset to. Yeah. And I had a huge panic, but the ASM was amazing and talked me through everything that I need to move as I was moving. I've done preset. And then the show goes and it's great. <laughs> yeah, I know what happens backstage, but I I don't know where that mug needs to go. Who's to say? Who's to say? And that's, you know, how amazing the stage managers are who are teaching you. And they always have your back because they want you to succeed as well. Um, so... I would recommend always asking questions. Never be afraid to ask questions, obviously at the right moment. Um, as you're training, and if it's not the right moment, write it down because otherwise you will forget. One of the things I always, always write down as I'm learning a new track is where to stand. That's a great tip. Because you don't want to stand in the wrong place and then cause a traffic jam, cause a safety problem. And that's something you often don't think about and is not necessarily explicit in the paperwork because these people just know where to stand because they built the track. Yeah. Um, but there's something very helpful for me. And then it also sometimes helped me lead me where, what I need to be focusing on. Where, where yeah. should I be right now? Should I go to the other side right now? Do I need to stand <laughs> upstage, downstage? Where, where in the world am I? And if, you, and if you don't even remember what's next, but you know where you need to be, you can kind of just look around and be like, oh, maybe that'll move next. <laughs> right, right, right. You can often figure it out. Yeah. And often people will shove with love, but it is helpful to have a general place of where to be shoved. Yeah, no, that's a great tip. Um, you kind of touched briefly on Gigi, and um, I wanted to ask you, you were with the show from its out-of-town tryout all the way to the Broadway one, correct? So I was actually with it from its very first reading in New York. Wow. Summer before, and I actually did not do the out-of-town tryout. <sighs> I know. And we'll scrap this question because no, I totally it, it, had wrong information. That's what really fine. It was confusing because I did work at the Kennedy Center, but on Little Dancer, which is now yes. Marie. Mm -hmm. But um, why I didn't do the out of town try of Gigi is because I was offered my equity card in New York on an off Broadway play. And what was that like? That was my next question. Please tell me <laughs> everything. Of course. So I was between doing Gigi out of town, which was a potential for a Broadway one, but at the time we didn't have a theater. And as most people know, if you don't have a theater, you're not going anywhere. Sure. So there was the hopes and the dreams, but nothing concrete. So the potential of my first Broadway show or getting my equity card. And I was so nervous about this pivotal decision. And this is where my having extraordinary mentors really kicked in because I called them all incessantly um, <laughs> going down the pros and the cons of what should I do. And I called the PSM of Gigi and told her the situation and she gave me her blessings and said, go get your equity card. Don't worry. You'll be, we'll be fine without you. This is what's better for your career. And I'm so glad that she completely supported me in that. And so I stayed in New York and I got my equity card. And then when our show in New York was wrapping up, Gigi announced that they got the Neil Simon theater on Broadway. And I was like, this, is my chance. 
and I was very nervous, but I decided to take the risk and I emailed and I asked if they needed a PA for the Broadway run, knowing that they could, positions could be filled, you know, everyone from out of town just yeah. moved to Broadway, which is often how it is. But I decided to take the jump off the deep end and ask because no one is going to offer you a job if they don't know you want it. So I always recommend asking for a job. They're not just going to hand it to you if you don't, if they don't know you want the job. So yeah. always. Yeah. And the worst they can do is say no. Exactly. Yeah. So it happened that they did need another PA for their Broadway run. They didn't say no. It was the most magical moment. I got the email that I got the job. I was just coming out of the subway at 42nd Street. It felt like a movie moment. Yes. In Times Square, reading the email that I got a Broadway show. And it was amazing. And um, it just also shows that how much luck plays into your career because I didn't do the out-of-town tryout, but I was lucky enough that they did actually need, had an open position and that I fit the qualifications, what they were looking for, and it worked out. Yeah, definitely, like, the preparation at the right moment, it, that feels very much the luck of that story, definitely. So I want to kind of transition now into talk into what I was so excited to talk to you about, Ellen, which you mentioned at the beginning of the podcast, was that you um, were the second as assistant stage manager on the national tour of Anastasia, which um, I was lucky enough to kind of be near you around the time that this was all developing. So I'm not saying that I feel like ownership of it, but I feel very proud of you for being on that show. Um, so can you tell me a little bit about how did your journey start with this show? How did you get hired? And um, talk to me kind of about like the rehearsal tech process for a show specifically that is being built to tour versus, you know, like a, a show that's staying in one venue. Totally. And you definitely should have ownership of the <laughs> for most of the ride. Um, I will tell the abridged version of how I got Anastasia. Amazing. So I knew about Anastasia was going on the road. My resume got in the hands of the PSM. I interviewed, did not get the job. And time goes by, they're in rehearsal, and the first gets a Broadway show. Wow. I love that Broadway show we, with we all love of my being. <laughs> and so the original second moves up to first, and they need a second to start ASAP if there ever was an ASAP no. um, because they were about to go out of town to tech the show. So they need to, you know, teach the ASM the show to tech the show to take cool. it around the country. Yeah. So um, another happenstance of being the right place, the right time, everything stars aligning. Um, I got the job in the end which is wow. insane. Months later, it all happened and I got the tour I dreamed of working on. And they remembered you. Yes. When they needed someone, they remembered you, which I think speaks so much to who you are and your character as a person. I do also give a lot of props to the first who's a very dear friend of mine, Rachel, because I think she definitely like she's great, you know, but it's also like being the right place, right time. And having the right friends when, where you need them. Yeah, she advocated for you. And that's so much of networking as well. Exactly. Um, so I got the phone call that I got the, sh the tour on Wednesday. I started rehearsal the following day. And a week later, we left for Schenectady, New York to tech. So I had one week to learn the show and to pack up my life for a year to two years. That's, that's a rough turnaround. It is, but it's also crazy because I feel like 
in everyone's career they have that kind of crazy insane movie moment and this was just mine um and it was so amazing i was very grateful that i had seen the show on broadway and at hartford so i had a concept of what i was walking into um and thank goodness for paperwork that i could be reading as i was like okay that's that person okay that's what a podium is here um and we were also very fortunate to have a lot of the real props in rehearsal so i knew exactly what i was looking for um and to be welcomed into such a warm, loving, home love family, Naja. Um, what I <laughs> and they're like, welcome. I was like, thank you. I have no idea what I'm doing. What's um, your name? <laughs> exactly, exactly. Name tags, everyone, please. Um, they were very good when I would call them the wrong name the first couple of days. Um, and then they would also introduce me. So they were everyone was very helpful. Very good. Very good. Um and it was an amazing experience. If anyone asked me about tech, I, it, it's like a car, in my mind it happened, but I can't remember most of it. Yeah. Uh, like a can lot I, of these techs. <laughs> yeah. Can I ask you about a very specific question about tech that I think you might remember more of, but um, what was it like teaching a show to local crew members, mm -hmm. IA crew members who um, are going to learn the show with tech, which is great because they have, they learn it with you as you go. Mm -hmm. um, and then you say bye-bye mm -hmm. and you get all your stuff into a truck and then you drive to the next venue and you meet four to 12 fresh new faces of crew members who you now have a day to teach the show to. What is that situation like? <laughs> It was definitely a lot of learning by trial and error, but I also, I also was very fortunate that the head carp was on stage left with me. So I asked him a lot of questions <laughs> like, is this normal? Is this okay? And, you know, I was very upfront with, hi, my first tour. I'm very excited to be here, but tell me what I'm doing wrong. And our crew, nothing but professionals have been touring for years on so many shows then they are so welcoming and warm to help you and say let's try this and I was like great that actually sounds like a great idea let's do that <laughs> and then as I you know understood the rhythm a couple cities in um I you know it was like I'd been doing it for years with them so it's like, you know, like any theater show you work together to create, but it is definitely a, something very specific to learn, to explain to people who have been doing load in all day, how the show runs and what the cues are, because they don't know who anybody is. They don't know characters, they don't know songs, they don't know that bizarre thing that you call um, they know it's a train um, and you know you have to be very specific about how you tell someone to push a train on um, when they don't know the nuances of the show because they've been building it all day yeah but you get to a point where you know how to explain how to page a curtain when the tall guy with the big fur hat enters because there's only one guy with the big fur hat going in. Um, so you get that language and um, you probably got this from your tour, but the locals in each city was what, you know, you call the crew that you pick up in each city are some of the most wonderful, hardworking people you will meet. Um, we got really attached to one of our locals who would, we have a train in the show and we, it was automated when it, it turned. But to go on off stage, you had two crew members push it. We had our head carp and then a local. And um, they would have a train jacket and a hat on. So they're in costume. <laughs> very early on, we decided that he would have to have a backstory. 
So we um, created a, a list of blank pages on one of the road boxes and then they would fill out the backstory of their train character, Igor Karhartsky, who worked at the train station in St. Petersburg. And they were some of the sweetest, funniest stories that things you would never think of for a backstory of someone who works at a train station in Russia. <laughs> and it always gave me so much joy to see all the different people who had such a big part of the show that most of the audiences don't know about. All of the yeah. people who touched the show before what they're seeing right now. Yeah. Oh. The IA crews across the land, they are, they are, as my mom would say, the goods. Um, so can you talk me through what a typical um, two weeks to a month of you like, like your typical stop in a city? What is it like from loading into the venue, doing the shows to loading out? What is the whole process? I want to know it all. Totally. So for Anastasia, we typically sat in a city for one week and we would load in Monday, Tuesday and load out Sunday night. So getting more specific, we traveled on Monday. The crew would start their load in for five hours Monday night. Then stage management would come in with the, re every, the rest of the crew 8 a.m. on Tuesday, load in the show. Excuse me. While that's happening, the orchestra is also playing the show for the first time together, often in a lobby or a rehearsal room because we don't travel, we didn't travel with the orchestra. We traveled with our music director and our assistant music director slash keys and our other keys player. And then everybody else would have to be learning it on their own and then play together for the first time Tuesday morning. Stressed, that makes me stressed. Right, but that's why they're professionals. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so um we're putting the set all together as that's happening you know stage management is helping with light focus for those who don't know stage managers on the road help with light focus for um for Anastasia it was conventionals versus moving light stage management was um in charge of for our shows the PSM the first while I ran around putting arrows everywhere to direct everyone to all the places you could possibly try and get to. Um, and then, you know, after we're all settled into our new home, we bring the orchestra back and we bring the cast, do some sound check to make sure it sounds beautiful. And then we'll do a fight call and a lift call. We got a lot of lifts and some big princess dresses. And then we run a show. And that is when we teach the locals how to do the show, which sounds crazy. But as we talked about, it's all about teaching the language about how to explain it to somebody who doesn't know anybody's names. And, you know, for example, we had nine, I believe, local wardrobe people come in at each city and they would have to learn how to put on these crazy princess dresses as it's happening and it's really about communication on all ends you know the actors would have to explain how it's helpful to have their pins for their wigs or what's the best way to get this giant skirt on and it's really about working together to create a beautiful show so that would all happen on Tuesday. <laughs> what a day. What a day. Wednesday morning we would sleep um, and then do a show. Thursday, Friday is one show day, but that's often when we do understudy rehearsals, put-ins, brush-up rehearsals, anything of that sort once everyone got a little sleep. Um, for us, we would do two shows Saturday, two shows Sunday, and then we would load out to try and get a couple hours sleep before we head on a bus or a plane Monday morning. Wow, I mean, it's, there's so much, even hearing you distill it into the succinct description you just 
described, like a week on tour can feel like a year in the real world. It is so much happening all the time. Um, so what, what are your favorite parts of touring and what are um, maybe the parts you'd leave if you could? Um, what are, what's, what's your likes and dislikes? Yeah, so I was really drawn to touring because it's also an adventure. It, um, you're sometimes feels like you're being paid to go on vacation. Yeah. <laughs> when you're in Fort Lauderdale or San Francisco, where I could never personally afford to live there if someone wasn't paying for it. <laughs> um, yes. And you get to go these places you never thought possible like Appleton, Wisconsin. I never thought I would go there and I had some of the best cheese. The best. <laughs> the best. And you get to meet such amazing people. And I really found my love for national parks being on the road. I got this little passport book and you'd stamp it at each national park and really exploring what America looks like. I grew up in North in northern New Jersey. I went to college in New York City. I spent the last 10 years there. So I hadn't really seen the rest of this beautiful country we live in. And I got to do that on tour while working on a show I loved. And it was also great to then you can reconnect with people who live all over the country. I have family who live in California, friends in Las Vegas, and all over. And I get to hang out with them and then share my show, which was so special. So wonderful. There's nothing I, one of my favorite parts about working on a show is bringing my friends or family backstage and watching, especially if they're a civilian, I call them, <laughs> who don't do theater and they think it's the most magical thing. And it rekindles. This is really cool. This is yeah. really freaking cool. One of my favorite things to do on a show, um, Anastasia had uh, a drop so we could walk across the stage while the house was open. My favorite thing to do would be to walk across the stage after the house is open and start to hear the audience and be like, I'm walking on the stage right now and everyone's so excited to see what's going to happen. They, they're so excited. They don't know what's going to happen. They have no idea what to expect to see on this stage and I get to work here and they cannot wait to see it. It's so, ugh, I'm, I'm getting tingles just thinking about that feeling. Oh, I can't wait to have it again. Um, so in general, touring is a wonderful adventure of America and, or internationally, if you are fortunate to have that kind of opportunity. But for me, it's also an adventure to finally get my hands really dirty in a sense for stage management. I got to do all the things I had learned about, dreamed about doing on a long running show and really feel at home there versus a lot of the shows I had worked on previously were only a couple months long where you finally feel like you settle in, you have your groove, you know how everybody works, you're a fun family, and then the show closes. And on the road, for me, that was the first time that that wasn't the case. We got to really experience everything together. Um, and it was, it was amazing. And I would do it again if I could. Amazing. Oh, I'm so, it's just so nice to hear fond memories, you know, of what we do. Um, can you talk to me a little bit about, I know you had a, um, a team switch up mm -hmm. on your tour and how was that to have um, a member of your team leave and a new member come in and what was it like integrating them into um, kind of a well-oiled machine? Totally. So this, as mentioned, this was my first tour. So everything was babies first, whatever. Um, so this was the first time for me that having a new team member, for us, it was a new PSM about a, a year in. So we, you know, we're a well-oiled machine. We could hear each other's thoughts. You know, we knew each other's breakfast orders. You know, we knew each other well, yeah. <laughs> especially on tour. So it was obviously a transition, but I was beyond lucky that the, for the original PSM and our new PSM were absolute pros. 
they had toured a bazillion shows. They had so much experience being on both sides of the coin, being the new team member and also being on the team that got a new person. So they knew exactly what happens, all the scenarios, and they, you know, gave us advice, told us what to expect, and made it really seamless for this transition that could really rattle the boat. And I was so lucky to have both of them for the whole process. And for me, I also feel super lucky because I got to work with two PSMs on one tour. So I really lucked out. Yes, yes. Um, that's, that's so good that, you know, people had the experiences to know how to integrate smoothly to a team. Um, can I ask you specifically when you, um, teched the show, you were on deck mm -hmm. and then a big part of touring when you're on a team of stage managers is kind of distributing the roles of you, not every night will be on deck, but you'll call the show as well, or you'll have a night to yourself in the office track or where you can catch up on paperwork. Um, how was learning to call a show that you did not tech? What was that process like? We talked about, you know, learning a deck track of this is where I stand and that's helpful. But what were your tips and tricks for learning a musical at that? Totally. So, um, you know, it's several parts for us. We knew that we could get down to a single deck track because we had the Broadway model to go off of. Our show is a little different. We um, did have a turntable like they did on Broadway, but we knew that it could work. So that puzzle piece was thankfully dealt with. But first we had to take the show that we both knew as single, as, as a two deck track. I started um, tech stage left and the first started stage right. And we met over lots and lots of coffee to figure out where is the most important for a stage manager to be for safety, for if this person's not here, that would really stop the show. Um, most of the time it came down to safety or big moments. And so we figured that out and then we tried it with each other and we trained each other on our sides. And then from there, the first started to learn how to call the show. And it was perfect that where it lined up in our schedule, timing wise, it was when we were on a four week set in Washington, DC. So we had the time to do all that without having to load in and load out of the show because you don't, you can't learn something new as you're loading out of the show. There's just <laughs> not enough time. Not possible. Not possible. Um, so we got a lot of that groundwork done during our first big set. And then slowly, uh, I started to learn how to call a show, but then we were back into the one week sit, so we could only do it chunks at a time. Yeah. But there's so many technology now that allows you to practice while the show is happening. We had a spare cue light box so I could practice and watch a monitor backstage and it's live so it's slightly different from the text. What was super fun to me about my track is that I got to do it all. You know I start my week doing stage left track and then transition to doing a single deck track once everyone was more familiar with the show and then I'd call my favorite show of the week, which is Saturday night, you know, the truth. Saturday night on tour. Saturday night on tour. Snots. <laughs> Snots. Um, and then I'd be on deck for the last show of the week to say goodbye to all my new friends. Um, so it was super fun because I was always moving around. You don't get bored. There's always something exciting and new and you're like, oh, hi, old friend. Um, so you're always moving around and doing something different, but the same at the same time, um, which is what's so fun to me about a long running show is the rotation. It's not just the PSM calls and the ASM is on deck. You get to move around. 
Yeah, you keep it fresh. And something that you, you touched on is getting getting that experience of stage management and something that we've talked about privately was, I know you were excited to to get to be able to call a show of a Broadway caliber, caliber mm-hmm. level with automated pieces. Like you said, like they may not be the Spider-Man end of the spectrum, but they, they are pieces that could hurt someone, you know? So being able to have that experience of working with those pieces, I think is something great that people, that experience people can get on tour. Exactly. And I think one of the awesome things about tour is because it's often a younger crowd, I should say, and younger is a very general term, but I feel like people without um, things holding them down, you know, you have a plant maybe, are more likely (laughs) to pick up and um, take their life on the road and live out of suitcases in hotels. So you have the opportunity to really get your hands dirty and get all this awesome experience on these Broadway level shows that you might not get on Broadway, which is why I pursued touring because I really wanted to get my hands dirty in stage management. I wanted to call, I wanted to be on deck, I wanted to put in new cast members, I wanted to do it all. And you get to do it on tour. And often it all happens in 48 hours that it all happens. <laughs> it's crazy. It's a microcosm and you get out of it and you're like, what, what year is it? Where am I? Um, <laughs> I wanted to ask a question maybe for um, the younger stage managers listening to this or early career or people in high school or college um, who may be in parts of the country that have a touring house and that's really their only connection to maybe Broadway or just theater in general. Um, I know I've, I've toured, I've shadowed on Broadway shows before. Does Anastasia allow shadows and how could like me 16 year old Claire interested in stage management connect with you all and get linked up for that. Totally. We love getting shadows. It was one of my favorite things because it that's was- shocking to me. <laughs> <laughs> um, I also shadowed everything I possibly could in college and after college until people said enough of you. <laughs> um, but it just, such an amazing experience and for anyone who hasn't shadowed I highly recommend it because for me it was so wonderful to see that actual normal people do this as a career and that was what was so incredible to me yes you learn so much by seeing it but just meeting people and talking to them human to human was just so amazing to me but for shadowing for on tour we would get people so many variety of ways. Some people would reach out to us via social media because they would look ahead and see us on the website. Some people would reach out to somebody in the the theater, um, like if it was in San Francisco, they would reach out to somebody at the theater in San Francisco. Sometimes it'd be the box off. It was It'd be like the most random thing and it would somehow trickle to stage management or sometimes the tours or um, the show social media. Whatever you can, do your research ahead of time and reach out because if they can, majority of the time they will say yes. There were some weeks where we had, you know, six people leaving the show. So there just unfortunately wasn't the time. Um, but I would say do your research as early as you can, because if we can plan it ahead of time, we're more likely to be able to get you in. And we love having you. The Everyone loves a new friendly face and always makes it more exciting. So do your research, see what shows are coming to your city and see if you can figure out who is the stage management team, whether you find them on social media or LinkedIn or reaching out to the theater or the show. If you try, everyone will help you and try and get your um, request to the right hands. 
Yeah, that's, that's, there's so many avenues, even one that you didn't mention, but I have once had success with is even just dropping off a letter at the stage door and just asking the kind security person, hi, could you pass this along to the stage management team? That, that works sometimes for a longer run. Um, but like you said, to remember, some weeks are just not the week for a team to have it. And that's not you. That's, that's just the show process in general. Yeah. Um, I wanted to kind of ask you about your life on the road tips and tricks. I mean, you, I would say, are a foremost expert now about living out of your suitcases, staying in a hotels, packing. What are your tips and tricks? How do you also stay in touch with your people back at home in New York and New Jersey and currently in my Chicago bedroom? How do you maintain connections with your, you know, outside network? Number one, TSA pre-check, non-negotiable. <laughs> Retweet, retweat. <laughs> Essential. Essential. You know you are only on a bus. Yeah. I mean, in life, you should get TSA pre-check, but it is a life changer, especially when that means five more minutes of sleep. Yeah. It is so amazing. You don't have to take off your shoes and it's a really easy process. Um, and I think it lasts a good number of years. I think it might be, it's either, the passport is 10 years, I think. And then TSA pre-check is five. So if you do it together, mm -hmm. sorry, now I'm just on a pedestal, but I did them at the same time so that I will have to renew the TSA pre-check and then at the 10 years, I'll do both of them again. But I literally cannot agree with you more <laughs> about TSA. It's, it's really the best. changes your life. Um, like packing tips, I would say packing cubes. If you're not familiar, you can get them anywhere. Um, I got mine at the container store, the most dangerous store on the planet. Um, yeah. All of my money. Um, and I got the expandable ones situation that would help them squeeze, which is helpful. Oh, yeah. Um, I would also recommend Tide Pods for your laundry purposes because I unfortunately had a friend who did not use Tide Pods and then there is laundry detergent all over their belongings in their trunk. Um, I was very happy that a friend of mine who had toured recommended Tide Pods at the beginning. Um, I also highly recommend those over the door hooks um, because a lot of bathrooms, Airbnbs, hotels don't have enough hooks in your bathroom for your towels, your bathrobes, what have you. And I also recommend, I believe on Amazon, I got this like deadbolt lock situation especially because it's a different place and you know myself as a single person um there's one place I stayed that didn't have a deadbolt and it really freaked me out and then my friend told me about this and you just take it with you and you lock yourself in it doesn't work when you're outside sure. but um, if you look up portable deadbolt travel lock you'll find it I'll link all of my favorites of what Ellen is talking about in the description of the podcast. Please do. Um, so those are my big packing things. Um, you also don't need as much as you think you do. You find, oh, these are the three shirts I wear over and over again. And you realize you want to burn everything you own because you have too many things. Oh, yes. Also very important. Get one of those scales for your suitcase. I was going to tack this on at the end if you didn't mention it. I was like, yes. the scale. It is key because you also don't want to, like, what do you do at the airport every single week? And they have it so you, you know, you don't have to hold the scale. It, you literally just pick it up. Um, it's a lifesaver. And um, I also recommend for those touring to pack as much as you can Saturday night so that if you need to shove anything in a road box or a hamper, you can do it Sunday before the next. Yeah, definitely. Sneaky tip. Um, 
for making yourself feel at home, I recommend don't worry about making your hotel or your Airbnb home. You know, obviously, if you want a cozy blanket or a candle, because sometimes hotels smell a little weird, um, totally about that. Um, but the theater will be your home. For me, I had all my little special like photos and little tchotchkes at the theater because my office would become my home. And that's where I was spending most of my time. And that's where my tour family was. That's what home was. That was the consistency. Um, so I would focus on that and not focus on making your, your hotels where you sleep and shower. Yeah, um, exactly. That, that's it. Um, for keeping in contact with people, I am an old lady and I still do cards for like birthdays and everything. So tour was a great way to buy postcards and I would just buy a bunch from wherever I was visiting and I would send them to people. Obviously, I got a lovely Valentine's card from Ellen and it made my entire week. I'm not going to lie. I love doing Valentine's. They're my favorite. It's sad that it's right after the holidays. I wish I had a little bit of a break. Um, but I think it's so important, important, especially now with all the, the this and, you know, like getting a handwritten card. I know I love it. So I figured most people love it too. Um, especially like, you know, you can go to some really fun, cool places. And then you're like sharing your memories with your friends and your family. Obviously there's FaceTime and Zoom and Skype and texting and phone calls. Um, but it's just like a helpful way, even if you don't have enough time for a phone call or your different time zones to just remind people that um, you love them. And I would always try and like post a picture um, of where I was in each city so to also remind people networking I still exist I'm alive um, <laughs> and especially if I was at a place that reminded me of somebody who I had worked with before I would like send them a message and be like I was at this theater we worked there hi, hi. <laughs> um but you know and you will reach out to people a lot because you also need to reach out to your support system who are no longer just right there that you can get yeah. coffee with your best friend. You then have to figure out your schedules um, and time zones. So you have to find what works for you for how much, what helpful to you. To me, phone calls were better than FaceTime because that seemed more normal. FaceTime is still a bizarre thing. <laughs> yeah that's it's a lot more you have to process with the face and the voice it truly is a lot yeah um Ellen I could talk to you for hours and we probably will chat in an after hours <laughs> session after this but I want to wrap up today asking for a production story from you uh, what is a funny scary sweetest amusing amazing classic story that you would like to share with us from any production that you've worked on Totally. So I'm going to pick an Anastasia one because Please. that's Please. <laughs> um, so there was this point in the show where a lot of um, the actors are going to this fancy party and they are entering with lovely shawls and jackets and they take them off and hand them to waiters. And um, there was this gorgeous jacket that was covered in beads Everyone always knows where the story is going when you say beads on stage. Oh, no. Beautiful. And, you know, the theater gods were against us this fine evening. And the jacket goes off. And beads erupt everywhere. I'm stressed. I'm stressed. Everywhere. <laughs> Mostly upstage, you know, they were contained by our giant flying wall. Good, but, great. You know, in like 15 minutes, there was going to be a big ballet with four dancers on point in this oh. area with all of these beads, tiny, tiny beads. So <laughs> obviously we were panicked backstage and it happened to be a night that me and the first were um, on stage with more brains 
and we let the wardrobe supervisor know this jacket is going to need to be repaired. And the dance captain's watching from the wings that night and our wardrobe supervisor said, we could put the dance captain in his waiter costume and send him out there. And then- Heck yeah. Uh, yes, I was like, yes, yes you did. <laughs> <laughs> and then our prop supervisor joined in. We have this broom from act one, he could use this. We um, got the blessing from our PSN. She said, send him on. And of course the dance captain knows the show better than anybody in terms of choreography. So he knew when the least distracting time for somebody in a costume to be sweeping up stage. <laughs> and then I think there was like two or three on each side of the stage, like hungry, hungry hippos gathering the bees as he'd be sweeping them and he'd exit and then come on. And then we'd like start laughing <laughs> as we noticed oh my God. the actor supposed to be on stage clocking him. Be like, what is he doing? It was amazing and so funny. We tell the story all the time because it was, you know, everyone working together to solve a problem. <laughs> oh, and was the ballet spectacular that night or what? Always. I mean, that ballet was <laughs> saying what they did, especially in. Anastasia, for those who don't know it, there's a ballet in the middle of Act Two. So they're in, you know, character shoes, dancing, like, 1920 styles, and they're also in a ballet. A ballet. Like, a full-on Swan Lake ballet. Into it. Into it. And then they have to then go back into their character shoes for a completely different kind of dance. It's, these people were magicians not yeah. actors, magicians, how they could just change how they move their bodies in a matter of seconds. Performers, they, they are multi-talented individuals and I respect the heck out of them. Mm -hmm. Ellen, thank you so much for joining me today. I have had the time of my life talking to you, as always, mm -hmm. as always. Me too, I'm so excited to chat with you. I know, okay, end of pod. With that, we have come to the end of episode nine of the Stage Manager Supply Co. podcast. Once again, brought to you by Rehearsal Room Coffee. Rehearsal Room Coffee. Okay, this part is not a joke for real, but the perfect equation for a good pot of Rehearsal Room Coffee is as follows. You should put as many spoonfuls of coffee as cups of water as you're making, plus one more spoonful for the pot. You are welcome. A huge thanks to Ellen for sharing her experiences with me, and a huge thanks to you for listening. My progress to becoming the Howard Stern of arts education is comparable to Dorothy leaving Munchkinland to follow the Yellow Brick Road. So much more journey ahead of me. Again, if you would like to signal boost or support Covenant House, their website will be linked in the episode description. If you enjoyed the podcast, please feel free to rate, review, and subscribe to us on your chosen podcast platform. Thank you again for listening, and I will catch you on the next one. Bye!